If you're using Graphene OS with out-of-the-box settings, then you are missing out on some of the greatest features that Graphene OS has. So in this video, I'm going to share my personal checklist that I use to install new Graphene OS phones, be it for family, friends, myself or clients. And this checklist is also valid for, or most parts, for when you're creating a new user profile on Graphene OS. So I'd say, let's get started. The very first thing before I install any store and any apps and change any settings is I create user profiles. And let me explain to you what I mean by that. These are my user profiles that I typically would use. And I would very much recommend you at least using a separate profile to the owner profile. Let me explain why. For one, user profiles, they are not specifically a Graphene OS feature, they're an upstream Android feature, but they can be used in Graphene OS to maximize privacy and security. And the idea is that you isolate parts of your digital life into different profiles. Now, you don't have to go overboard like I have here, but I will talk you through why I've done this and how it helps. Because if you install everything into the owner profile or the primary or admin profile and use only that, then you have no isolation whatsoever. So if there's a misbehaving app, maybe in, there was a, a digital supply chain attack on the app and there's malicious code in it, or the app just misbehaves or tracks in general and you might not have noticed or given it a permission that it shouldn't have, then it will be able to wreak havoc on quite a few things in general. So you want to isolate these things into separate parts. And the idea here is that um, I usually isolate anything that needs Google Play services in a separate profile that I can log out of and then nothing is running. They will not be running on the main profile that I use. Most things I run on a main profile and if you're really into privacy, I would really not call the profiles like your call, don't use your first name. Primary is usually the name that I use for the owner profile and that is usually empty. There's a special case there that I'll get into in a moment. And there's a profile me, which is usually my main profile with the main apps. If you have kids, a kid's profile is quite a good idea. Very limited set of, of apps, bit of streaming, maybe a few games. You disallow um, them to install apps and that way you can have a safer environment for kids. And usually apps that are for finance and for banking and things like that, I will separate them because I think they should be protected in a specific way. They don't have to be in the same user profile as maybe a game or a navigation app or other things. And I usually have a private profile that is usually for surfing, learning, reading politics, things like that, because I don't want that mixed up with my other profiles. Now, to activate profiles, you would go to your settings and then you go all the way down to system and there you tap on multiple users and you have to have that activated. So if you activate it, then you'll be able to start creating your own users. And here I'll show you the settings for the kids user profile, for example. This cannot use phone calls and SMS. I will disallow installing apps and installing apps from third party sources. So that way I can ensure that this profile will only have the apps that I want this profile to have and nothing else. And you can, if you have set up and you're using your Graphene OS phone already and you just want to migrate, there's quite a nice migration option. You can tap on install available apps and then it will show you the apps that you have installed and you can say, oh, well, okay, I want Charge Map and Charge Finder, for example, uh, to be transferred and copied into that profile. So that will be a way of creating multiple profiles and you really at least want to have one separate one because it comes with two additional advantages next to the whole isolation thing. And one advantage is that you can delete a user profile completely and that is something that you might really want to have. So um, when you're logged in with your owner account, you can't delete it. So the only way would be wiping the phone. But if it's a profile, a separate user profile, you can just wipe the profile and everything else exists. Now, why would that be important? 
um, well, I used to travel and I sometimes still do um, to countries that maybe have a different interpretation of the rule of law and protections for individual rights. And in that case, um, these countries will, in some cases, when you're entering and you're at the border, they will insist on taking your phone with them. They'll take it to a separate room. You will have no, you will not know what they'll be doing and they'll keep the phone for half an hour, once even for an hour. And I had no idea what they're doing with the phone. So the idea here is you have it in a separate user profile. If they really insist on taking it, you delete the profile and give them the phone. And then the phone isn't empty because it's highly suspicious if you come to the border and somebody wants to take your phone to see if there's anything unhealthy for society on it. And, uh, and then uh, you give them a wiped phone. I mean, that just shouts uh, that you're doing unhealthy things. So um, in that case, even I have that with journalists and, and NGOs, employees from NGOs. They very often have the user profile filled with actual accounts, but only sort of the non really private stuff. They'll have a super simple Instagram account installed with some recipes and food stuff, maybe some cars or architecture. They might be logged in into a simple email account and a few other things, and that makes the, the owner account more believable. And then you have separate accounts for the real stuff that you're doing. So let's do a quick overview of all the settings that I changed. Now under network and the Wi-Fi network under network preferences, make sure that you turn off, turn on Wi-Fi automatically, that should be off, and notify for public networks also off, because I've seen this attack in the wild with clients mainly. Um, there are rogue access points or there can be rogue access points out there that have the same names as your Wi-Fi, maybe at home or at work. And in that case, you don't want your phone to automatically scan for other Wi-Fi's while the Wi-Fi is off um, because it just drains a little bit of battery. And you don't want your phone authenticating against rogue Wi-Fi hotspots that might be somewhere um, between your home and work. So that's something that I always switch off. And the next thing that I do is I go to hotspot and tethering. And here in the Wi-Fi hotspot settings, I change the hotspot name. You don't want your name in there. And I see that as well as for Bluetooth as for Wi-Fi that are shared, that people have their full name in there. I see that in trains, public transport and other things. So just make it some, something generic. And the hotspot password, I would set it to something that is memorable, not too complicated, but long enough. So if I share it with other people a lot, then I will use two or three words. Kebab case with a hyphen between them because it's easy to say. I like pizza would be a really bad example, for example, with hyphens in between. And um, I said turn off um, hotspot automatically. Concerning the password, you could make it more complicated if you use it only for yourself. That very much depends on how much Wi-Fi hotspots you use and how long you stay at one spot with the same hotspot. Okay, so the next thing that I like changing here or like checking up is private DNS. You can leave that to automatic. If you have a private uh, DNS provider like NoDNS or even your own VPS, you could put it in there and otherwise settings here are usually quite fine. Now, the next thing that I like changing is in Bluetooth settings, connection preferences, Bluetooth, and here you also want to change your device name. And here, Graphene OS by default will switch off your Wi-Fi after it's not used and the default setting is fine, but it doesn't automatically switch off your Bluetooth. Now, I use a lot of headsets, so I find it very frustrating when after half an hour or an hour I get a phone call, I want to put my switch on my headset and start um, calling. In that case, it's terrible if, if devices switch off their Bluetooth. So I don't like this setting, but most people will probably prefer to have Bluetooth switch off automatically too. So I would suggest setting it to one or two minutes, depending on your preferences. Now, the next thing that you want to look at is that, or make sure that NFC is off and that cloud printing on the print service is also off. Now, there's a few more things. Um, under notifications, 
I like to make sure that sensitive not notifications is definitely off because when your lock screen is on, your phone is locked, you don't want any sensitive data being shown on the lock screen. And the bottom, that is sort of um, up to your taste. I like the icon on the, the dot on the app icons and I also like the Android enhanced notifications, even if they are not always very usable. Now, battery wise, I just set up battery percentage because I like to know how full or empty my, bat my battery is. Now, one of the absolute killer features is storage scopes. That is the reason why I used to jailbreak uh, iPhones and set up extra um, uh, permissions on there and that is the main reason why I used to root Androids for the exposed framework to be able to set this up. Now at last you don't have to run around with an unlocked bootloader and do all kinds of terrible things to the whole security infrastructure. You can just you have it out of the box here in Graphene OS. And storage scopes they allow you to specifically give every app its own folder so it's nice and sandboxed. Something that iOS has been doing for quite some time now, um, but that uh, Android just hasn't implemented um, and you can force it onto the apps here, which is great. Um, so usually, as I said, this will t come up when an app really wants to access files, but I will show you how it's set up here with an example. You go to Privacy, Permissions Manager, Files, and here we'll choose an app that wants uh, file access, Thermux, for example, or Termux, which is an SSH client or emulator more like, and here you have storage scopes. So if Termux would ask me for file access, I could say enable storage scopes. And in this case, you can set a folder, a file or an image. I usually do folders. And then I give the app a folder, a subfolder of the downloads folder which has the same name as the app itself. Folders outside of the downloads folders are not supported, so you have to do something in the downloads folder anyway. Um, if you have apps that you use together because you might be posting videos and you have some kind of video editor or something like that, you could also just make a subfolder video editing or something and then give several apps access to that. And you can give an app access to several folders, not only just one. So there's a lot of a um, lot of ways of um, configuring it. My default really is just one app um, gets one folder and that is in 99.9% .9 of the cases is the standard configuration. So there's a few more things that I like to set up on privacy. Usually um, that's something that is um, set by default and that's I think a very bad setting by default. Sensor permissions to apps by default should not be allowed, so you want to switch that off. And usually I have camera access, microphone access um, per default off. And um, show passwords should also be off because you don't want the first letter of your passwords uh, appearing. And I don't mind media on lock screen, but most people say that, or lots of people don't like that. Let's put it like that. So you might want to switch that off and I really want to see when an app wants to paste something so um, show clipboard access is something that should definitely be on. Now a few last things here before we start installing apps. Under security there's now this is this is nearly a religious debate so um, we'll do the short version. Pin fingerprints. Now there's two ways of going by this. There's I like using fingerprints, but that depends on your threat um, vector and threat model because I'm more afraid of criminals that see me entering a pin or maybe a CCTV camera recording my pin while I'm typing it in and then some criminal snatching my phone and then having access to all my data, my banking apps and things like that, depending on which profile was active at that moment in time. So that is for me the worst case. Um, so I will use a fingerprint in public spaces, in public transport, because nobody can ever see your pin being typed in. So I don't mind that. The downside of this is, of course, if you're afraid of authorities snatching away your phone or criminals forcefully taking your phone and then um, forcing you to put your finger on it, which I have heard nearly or next to no reports of, then you might want to consider leaving the fingerprint away altogether and just using a pin. 
um, but I use the fingerprint um, in addition to the pin. Now, a good thing is to scramble the pin input layout, then you don't have the standard one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on, it will always be something else. I'm a bit too stressed for that, and I have kids juggling all kinds of things, so in that case, um, it just consumes too much mental capacity on a, on a heavy work day and kids day, so I leave that off, but that is maybe not the best decision, so you might want to leave that on. And allow camera access when the device is locked, I have that off because um, I can quickly unlock the phone if I really want to use the camera. So in this case now, we've locked it down quite a bit and that might be a bit uncomfortable if you want to quickly navigate or do other things. So what I really like to do at the top here is change my quick settings, okay? So usually location is something that I don't have to be able to switch on and off very quickly, but microphone access for phone calls and things like that, that is something that I like to have up there. So I'll pull this down here, tap on edit, and I will pull the mic access up and Camera access would be something that you could put to the top depending on how important it is to you. So there, we'll set it up there. And now in this case, when we fold it all together again, you now can quickly activate and deactivate the microphone access. And that is something very special about Graphene OS. If I go into a really important meeting um, or if I have a very private discussion at home, for example, or if I'm talking to a financial advisor, whatever else, or my lawyer, um, then I will switch off the microphone access and then I know with quite a good certainty that this device will most probably not be eavesdropping on me. And that is some, so just a peace of mind which I think is quite important. And that is also one of the killer features, I think, of Graphene OS. So you want to use it, you want to set it up, but you will only be using it if you can really access it very easily. So that's why you want to have it in your quick access. Now, in general, you can configure the whole thing as you wish. Please remember that uh, Google Wallet doesn't work, so you don't have to have that anywhere on the first screen. Completely useless. And I usually have my WireGuard VPNs and other things here for faster access. The nice thing here is that you can always see what apps are active and if it's an app that you can kill, you can just quickly shoot it off. And as with standard Android, you have your quick uh, user switch here or your user profile switch. Now let's get into installing apps. And one of the first bits of advice that you get is install the F-Droid store. And I really think that is not a good security practice. The F-Droid guys and girls are great. It's a repository and an app, but I just don't quite agree on the F-Droid app itself because the website itself gives you an older version than the newest version and you then always have an update to update. Um, I think that's probably for compatibility reasons, but that's just not good security practice. And the other thing is you'll get into a, a hell of a trouble if you add a user profile and want to use F-Droid on the new user profile because in Android there's a security setting that you can't install an older version of an app in another user profile if you have a newer one somewhere else. And then you lock yourself out of F-Droid, out of the F-Droid store, if you have it installed on another profile and update it there, but then on the new user profile you go to F-Droid and, and install the version there. So what I like to do is I like to install the Neo store and that uses the F-Droid repository you're getting all the F-Droid goodness, but um, you have a much nicer, faster interface and you have some really nice filtering options. Now, if it doesn't come up on a Neo store, just Google for Neo store GitHub. And in that case, you'll get to this uh, nice page. And here, right at the bottom, you'll find releases. I tap on the um, bold releases headline. And here, under the newest release, you tap on the APK and then it will want to download and install. Now, I've got it on the phone already, so we don't have to do that. And I'll, um, I'll start it and show you. This is what the Neo Store will look like when you've started the first time. You want to once tap on synchronize and it will then pull the repository, it's about eight megabytes, and show you all the apps. Now, for one, you have really nice filters. 
So it's very nice to just discover all the apps and there are a lot more apps there than you might believe and think. You can filter by recently updated, which I think is really nice. So you can see what apps there are and what you can use. And it's quite inspiring having a look at what activity is there and what the new things are. And of course you can see your installed apps and update them. But where Neostore really shines is when you tap on an app and then you get this wonderful graph at the top on what permissions and security state it's in. It will explain to you how many permissions it wants and you have a super fast overview over um, when the last version was released and you can tap on this little sign here and it will show you all the permissions that this app wants. So you get a much faster overview over what this app is actually doing that you are intending, of install, intending to install on your phone. And you'll have the releases right at the bottom with the option to just roll back to an older release. And I think that is just a wonderful interface. Favorite the app that you like to have and install the apps that you want. And here I install an app, you probably have heard it already, the Aurora Store. And here I tap download and install it. Now, of course, the Neo Store is not allowed to install uh, new apps. So it will pop up, the Vanadium browser will first pop up for the Neo Store and ask you, are you sure you wanna allow this to install apps? You'll have to go to settings and activate it. And then the same thing when you are in Neo Store to install Aurora Store. Now let's start the Aurora Store itself. If you tap on it for the first time, you'll get this uh, user model or this uh, splash screen to accept the terms of services and terms of service. There's some FAQs, you just next that. Session installer is fine. You can decide on what theme you want. I'll take the system theme choose an accent color. I usually try and take the same color as the user profile color of this Android user. Um, I'll just take purple here, next. And here you have to grant all the permissions for installing, for external storage and everything else. I'll tap allow and then tap on finish. And now Aura Store wants you to, to log in. Now, this is, I've had that in my installation video already. Um, there's a few tricks here. Usually Aurora Store has a whole bunch of Google accounts and then when people want to install something, they tap on anonymous, they get logged in in the background in one of these generic Google accounts and then you can access the Aurora Store and download apps. But with the increasing um, popularity of Graphene OS and the Aurora Store and Calyx and others, um, there's a lot of rate limiting going on. So quite often if you tap on anonymous and log in, you'll get an error message or you'll maybe only be allowed to or able to download one or two apps. So in that case, you might have to log out and log back in. Or what you can also do, sounds a bit counterintuitive, but you can also just create a throwaway Google account and install a few of the apps if Aurora is really not working at that moment in time and just log in with that Google account here on this screen. So there's different uh, ways of doing it. In this case, you can see uh, I'm rate limited. So in that case, I won't be able to install something. It worked just fine on, the, um, on my installation video that's linked below. So in that case, um, usually it would work just fine. Um, just give it a moment. And as you see here, um, it's then logged in and you have full access to uh, the Google Play Store. Now, you have to be careful here. Many of these apps will need uh, Google Play services. So you'll have to have Google Play services sandbox and installed. To do that, you go on apps and here you have Google Play services and you would say install here. In this case, it's installed already. So I don't have to install them again. Now, this is a general setup. There's a few things that you can do on top of that, just to give you a few ideas. Um, now we had to give Vanadium the permission to install apps for us so we could install the Neo Store. And the Neo Store, we had to give permissions to be able to install apps so we could install the Aura Store. Um, I don't like surfing with a browser that is in general allowed to install apps. So Vanadium is a hardened browser same as the whole um, 
whole graphene OS. There's lots of hardening going on uh, in, under the hood. But in this case, I like to take away the permission to install apps from the Vanadium browser when I've done this. This is one of the last points on the checklist. So I'll go to Privacy, Permissions Manager, and there, oh, it's always a bit difficult to find. No, we'll do it under Apps, Vanadium, and Install Unknown Apps is allowed, and I would disallow this. Now, how do I install an apps? Well, if I want to install an app with a browser, it will just ask me, bring me to settings, I can activate it, and then you just have to think of deactivating it. That would be an option. Or you can just install the privacy browser from a Neostore slash Fdroid, or you could install Fennec, which is kind of the, it's actually called Phoenix, but in the store it's called Fennec. That's sort of Firefox um, as a secondary browser. And then I'd have one browser, to surf and install apps and do maintenance things on the device itself. And I would have um, the standard Vanadium browser for just everyday web surfing. So that is a very quick overview over all the different settings that you can do um, to improve security, privacy and battery life of your device. Um, please join me on my journey to, be, to become digitally independent and I will be doing lots of videos on Android um, device privacy and security, but also on self-hosting, self-hosting your own services and data. So please leave, give this video a like, a thumbs up to show YouTube that I'm doing a good job and that this was informative and consider subscribing. It's free and it shows your support. Thank you very much and have lots of fun. See you soon. Bye-bye.